look at the profitability of kingdom service. Exodus chapter 23 and in verse 25. And you shall serve the Lord your God and he shall bless your bread and your water and it will take away sickness from the midst of thee. He said, and there shall nothing cast their young in your land, nor be barren. He said, the number of your days I will fulfill. Now, by way of introduction, we have mentioned three things in the first service. I'm going to mention them again and then add a few words to what I already said in the first service. First of all, we said that seeking and serving God are gainful adventures of life. They are never wasteful endeavors. They are gainful. The Bible said concerning the children of Israel in, in Genesis in Isaiah chapter 45 verse 19 he said I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I have not said to the seed of Jacob seek ye me in vain. I said in the first service that God never called anybody to waste their time. He never called anybody to waste their lives. I want to add that serving God is never a regrettable activity. Serving God is not a regrettable, regrettable action. Serving God is rewardable. Serving God is profitable. Serving God is profitable. We don't serve God unto losses. We serve God unto profit. We don't seek God and serve God and end in losses. We seek God, we serve God and end with profit. Number two, we said that God is never a user of people. God is a raiser of people. A maker of people. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 19 we saw how Jesus spoke to Peter and Andrew and he said follow me and I will make you. The service of God is the secret of the making of people. Follow me and I will make you. Serving God is behind the making of people. Listen to this. God is not trying to become something by your help. He is not trying to become something by the help of man. He is already the almighty. There is nothing that can be added to God to make him mightier. But he is trying to turn you into something by his help. He is the one trying to turn man into something by his help that was why he said come and i will make you very important thirdly we said that god is a rewarder of labor he does not just remember your labor he rewards your labor we saw all that in hebrews chapter 6 verse 10 god is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which you have showed to us his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. He is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, he spoke about how that without faith it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Listen to this. It is God who said the laborer is worthy of his hire. First Timothy chapter 5 verse 18. The laborer is worthy. The laborer. For the scripture said, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. And the laborer is worthy of his wages. Worthy of his reward. God who gave such a word will never keep back the reward of kingdom laborers. He will never keep back. 
Lift your right hand and say, I am not wasting my time serving the Lord. I am not wasting my time following the Lord. Say after me, I am not wasting my life. I know what I am doing. So what is the profit of labor? What is the profit of service? We dealt extensively with four of them in the first service. I will mention them. And then we'll deal extensively with another four in the first service. Number one is supernatural supplies. You shall serve the Lord your God. And he shall bless your bread and your water. Supernatural supplies. When you do his will, he pays your bills. It is proven. When you do his will, he pays your bills. When you work for him, he ensures you don't work at your own expense. Supernatural supplies. Number two is divine health and vitality. You have energy, you have strength, you have capacity. God can be interested in you. Making use of your services and an, an enemy cut you short before your time. Divine health and vitality. It shall take away sickness from inside your liver, inside your kidney, inside your lungs. It shall, you shall serve the Lord. It shall take away sickness from the midst of you. Number three is distinction and worth. To, st st to stand out for him is to stand out in life. When you step out for God, you stand out in life. I will spare them. I will make up my jewels. You shall return and distinguish between him that serves God and him that serves him not. Malachi chapter 3 and in verse 18. You shall distinguish between him who serves God and him who serves him not. Distinction and worth. Number four is deliverance and liberty. Israel is my firstborn. Let my son go that he may serve me or else I slay your son. Exodus chapter 4 verse 23. No Pharaoh is Pharaoh enough to tie down a life that is, that is determined to serve God. No ancestral curse, generational curse, witchcraft curse is curse enough to hold down the destiny of that person who is determined to serve God. And on that note and premise, I declare and prophesy to somebody, everything that ties other people down in your family, as you have made up your mind to serve God, I declare the yoke is broken. Every sickness that is trying to distract your service of God. Today, by the anointing with which I preach, it is flushed out. Take your seat. Let my son go. That he may serve me. If you are ready to serve God, the enemy must let you go. The devil must let you go. The witches, the wizards must let you go. Number five is divine life and longevity. Divine life. Exodus 23, 25, 26. You shall serve the Lord your God. He shall bless your bread and your water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of you. There shall nothing cast their young nor be barren in thy land. The number of your days I will fulfill. The number of your days I will fulfill. Provided you are ready to serve me. And how is that number of days like? Exodus, Deuteronomy chapter 34. We saw the life of Moses in verse 5. And then in verse 7. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there. In the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. The number of your days 
I will fulfill. Listen to this. If you are determined to live your life in the service of God, no power is powerful enough to shorten your lifespan. If you are determined to live your life in the service of God, no power is powerful enough to shorten your lifespan. No witchcraft power, no occultic power, no power of any wicked man or woman on earth is powerful enough to shorten your lifespan. You know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it is important for you to know this. So that you are not just serving the Lord. And thinking that you are just doing church a favor. I mean, I'm just assisting in, in what way I can assist. Without any benefit coming from it. No. You know you can have something and you don't know what you have. Longevity. Kingdom service. Connects kingdom servants with divine life. It connects kingdom servants with divine life. The life of God flows for those who are involved in the work of God. The life of God flows. Nobody suffered like Paul the Apostle. Yet death could not kill him. Until, I mean, naturally. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 21, he said, For to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. I am going to spend my life for Christ. And my death will be a gainful death. And when, how did, when did he die? Philemon chapter, chapter 1, only one chapter, verse 9. The Bible calls him Paul the agent. Paul. Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the agent. Despite all the persecutions he passed through. He said it was one night, one day in the depth of, of the ocean. He was beaten three times with rods, shipwrecked many times. Satan attempted Paul, but he couldn't cut him for because for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And because of that, he lived until he became Paul the aged. He was aged. In our village, you don't say somebody is aged if he's 70 years. No. He's, a, he's an old, he's, he's, he's elderly, he's getting old, he's, he's still even young. Eight is, he's an old, getting old. Aged. When you're talking of 90, 100, he's aged. Age has dealt with him. That was how Paul the Apostle was. I like you to dash yourself to God. And the devil that can suffocate your life does not exist. I declare upon somebody here, every demon of premature death looking for you will never locate you. <laughs> Divine life number six is honor and dignity. Proverbs 27 verse 18. He said, Whoso keepeth the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof. So he that waited on his master shall be honored. He that waited on his master shall be honored. The servant who serves his master well cannot escape honor. Those who are called into full-time ministry to serve God fully, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 4, said, no man taketh this honor upon himself except he that is called. Beloved, the path of service is the path of honor. The path of service is the path of honor. The honor of the master flows upon the servant. The honor of the master flows upon the servant. The honor of the master flows upon the servant. Do you remember the donkey that carried Jesus to Jerusalem? They spread cloth for the donkey. But the cloth was spread for the master. But it was the donkey that matched the cloth. The honor of the master flows. Any 
anybody who is genuinely anointed and genuinely donated to God cannot escape honor. If the world like they should, whatever they want, they can do, but they can't escape honor. Billy Graham, in his days, had the privilege of being consulted by every president of America on any major issue from Dwight and Sanhawa all the way to Nixon, Richard Nixon, all the way to Gerard Ford, all the way Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, George Bush the first, Clinton, George Bush the second, all of them. They needed this counsel. I heard that where they received the queen at the airport in England was where they normally received him if he arrived. That was honor. Somebody say, why is he, car why is, is he carrying himself like that? Why, why, why is everybody running around for him? It's not his fault. It's not his fault. The honor of his master is upon him. The same way it's not the fault of the donkey that is matching the ground. It is because of who the donkey is carrying. The donkey is matching the cloth as well. Why is the donkey matching on people's cloth? The people spread it for the master. And the master is not walking on the ground. So the donkey is walking on it. My wife and I traveled to Europe some time ago. And a, man's, a man sat in the premium class. And his dog sat beside him. He paid the ticket. Imagine paying first class or business class ticket for your dog. And people are sitting in the coach. And I don't care how old you are. The dog is in front. Because of who owns the dog. I, mean, I, I can never recover from the lesson I learned that day. I said, what happened? They say, the man, the man wants his dog to sit with, with him. And he paid the ticket. The dog has passport. Yes, he has dog passport. Yes. You can't just carry any dog and travel. You need to process his passport. Yes. And they have to certify that the dog is okay. Immunization, clear everything all the way from here and from outside the country. They must clear the dog for travel. And the man paid for it. The man had special food for the dog. The dog was eating special food in the aircraft. And I asked the man, I said, what happened? He said, oh, this is his food. I said, what about the aircraft food? He said, he can't eat it. He said, if he eats that food, all of us will not <laughs> be at rest. He said, it will trouble his system. It was the most civilized dog I have ever seen in my life. He didn't make one pim. No, whoa, 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 not, not the village dogs that... Not bingo. <laughs> it was just looking like this. <laughs> Take your seat. <laughs> the dog was just you would think that it was a toy. You think that the dog was, it would just look like this. No sound from beginning to end. No wonder he sat where they sat him. Do you understand what I'm saying? He that waited on his master shall be honored. Everyone here that people are mocking and your life looks like a pity or a shame or a disgrace, yet you are serving God. I decree those days are over forever. The shame is over. The mockery is over. The disgrace is over. Shout the loudest. Amen. Take your seat. It is a path of honor 
and dignity. Number seven is supernatural fruitfulness. Supernatural fruitfulness. There shall be nothing barren among you. Nothing cast their young, nor be barren in the land. To be fruitful in the vineyard is to be fruitful in life. This is important to know so that the devil does not cheat you out on your destiny. To be fruitful in the vineyard is to be fruitful in the body. Productivity is a service covenant package. It's part of the service covenant package. When you serve God, there is a package. Inside that package is productivity. Fruitlessness is forbidden in the covenant of service. That was why Zechariah served and he continued serving until in Luke chapter 1 verse 8 all the way to verse 14 while he was at his duty post executing the priest's office. He, he, he didn't allow the situation of himself and his wife to stop him from serving. He kept on serving until one day at the point of service, the angel arrived and said, now your prayers are answered. Since the barrenness couldn't stop you from evangelism, couldn't stop you from your duty post, now the barrenness must stop. And they gave birth, not to an ordinary child, they gave birth to a fire, a burning and a shining light. His name, John the Baptist, who spoke until he compelled the whole of Jerusalem to come. Beloved brothers and sisters, you cannot be fruitful for God and be barren in life. Your business, your finances, your things must be fruitful if you are fruitful for God. And number eight is the anointing. The anointing of God. The Bible said in the book of Psalm 89 verse 20, I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. The anointing of God is in search of servants. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. When the anointing, when, when servants are found by God, they don't beg for oil. You don't beg for oil from God if you are qualified and certified as a servant. You don't beg for oil. You don't beg God for oil. In Zechariah chapter 4 verse 12 to 14, there were two anointed ones that stood by the Lord of the whole earth. In Zechariah, and I answered again and said unto him, what are these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what this be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. You know what it means to stand by, to wait on God, is to soak in oil. You know, a real servant is a waiter. You know how the, a waiter is in a hotel? A waiter, a waitress. When you wait on God, you soak in oil. When you wait on God, you wait on God, you become a permanent channel. Now, here is the, is the word. When you, are, when you are committed to his assignment, you are connected to his endowment. When you are committed to his assignment, you are connected to his endowment. When you cannot be connected to the assignment and be lacking in endowment, you can't be committed to the assignment and be lacking in endowment. No way. You don't beg for power. You don't beg for oil. You don't beg for the anointing. If you are in his assignment, you never run dry of oil. Someone here today, you will never run dry of oil forever. Number nine is divine preservation. Divine preservation. I'll look at that in the next service. But he said he will spare them as one spared his servant his son that serveth him. Divine preservation. That is disaster calamity may be available but not for you. Divine preservation. Number 10 is divine presence. 
divine presence. They went and the Lord went with him. Divine presence. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. All right, divine presence. Let's stop there. We'll, we'll deal with that in the next service. Divine presence. When you come around real servants of God, you feel God. You feel God around them. Divine presence. Number 11 is divine direction. Divine direction. Speak, Lord, for thy servant hear it. Speak, Lord, for thy servant hear it. That was what? Eli counseled Samuel to speak. Speak, Lord. The master speak it and servants hear it. <laughs> I mean, you cannot be a servant and, and, and just be devoid of instruction. And I'll come to the detail of that later. In the first service I said, the direction that gave me direction for marriage came on the ground of kingdom service. Kingdom service. Divine direction. And number 12, eternal rewards. Eternal rewards. Your labor in the Lord is never in vain. Those last four, 9, 10, 11, 12, will deal extensively with them in the last service. Finally, what is the counsel today? Determine to live for God and serve God with your life. While you have both time and strength. While you have both time and strength. Fading away like the stars of the morning. Losing their light in the glorious sun. Dust would we pass from the earth and its toiling. Only remember. your life serving personal and earthly interests when you meet God what will you say that is all that you did with your life was personal all that you did with your life was earthly nothing kingdom nothing eternal what will you say and yet the major duration of our life is in eternity. Determine. Number two. Avoid those temptations that hinder effective service. There are people who should have been serving God more effectively than they are, that they are, do, doing, than they are doing now. But there are certain temptations. We looked at them extensively in the midweek, Wednesday. Please pick it up. But let me rush through them. There are about seven of them or so. Number one is the temptation not to go far in God. The temptation not to go far in service. The temptation to say, take it easy. Don't carry church on your head. It's not only you. Don't be a fanatic. Be okay. Just be normal. That was the temptation number one. Pharaoh gave to the children of Israel. He said, where you are going, don't, don't go too far. Number two was the temptation not to take others along, especially our loved ones. Temptation to serve God alone. Pharaoh told them, you can go and serve God in the wilderness, but leave your loved ones behind. Where your life is not affecting anybody at all for God. Number three is the temptation to serve God without cost. Pharaoh told them, leave your cattle behind. Leave your resources behind. Go into the wilderness and serve God only you. The scriptures are there. Moses said, no. We will serve God with what we have. And we said that costless service is profitless service. 
We serve God with our time. We serve God with our resources, with our finances. Number four is the temptation of comparing your commitment to God with that of others. Ah, other people are not doing like that. I can't kill myself for, for this thing. When you look at other people and you look at what they do, you will be tempted to slack in what you are meant to do for God. The temptation of comparing your commitment to God. You don't want, you don't want to commit your commit, compare with other people because all of us will stand individually before God to give the account of our lives. Number five was the temptation of weariness in service. You just serve God until you got tired. Nobody is even appreciating me. Nobody is even watching what I'm doing. Truth is, you are not doing it for anybody. I'm tired. The expe my, my, my expectations haven't come to pass. Even those who are not serving God like I am doing seem to be more successful. That devil is a bastard. The Bible says, be not weary in well-doing. Don't be tired of what you are doing for God. He said, because in the due season, you will reap if you are not tired. There was a time in my own life where it looked like other people were more successful in what they were doing for God. But we kept on. We just kept on. We just kept on. And today, God proved himself. The temptation of weariness. Number six is the temptation of waiting for perfect conditions. No, when I, when I, when I finish school, I will serve God more. Now I'm a student. No, wait yet. When I, when I get married, I will serve God more. I will, serve, I, will, I will serve God like fire. Oh no. Okay. Now, after, I, after I'm married, let me get a child first. The Bible said if we wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. When I become a billionaire, then I will start, I will start, I will start giving towards the cause of the kingdom. No. God is watching what you do with one naira. The temptation of waiting for perfect conditions. And then finally is the temptation of offense. They are looking for my trouble. They are not greeting me well. They are not treating me well. Departmental people are just all manner. But understand that offense will come. Matthew chapter 18 verse 7. He said, woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. The only person that will not be offended is the person in the grave. All these temptations come. To slack your service of God. But if you refuse the temptations. Then you will arrive. In distinction. I pray for somebody today. Fresh grace. To serve God like never before. Be released upon your life. Fresh grace. To serve God like never before. Be released upon your life.